Hi, I'm Dr. Pierce, and welcome to this video on energy flow and energy pyramids. Ecosystems need both nutrients and energy to grow, reproduce, and maintain homeostasis. Now, nutrients are limited and thus need to be constantly recycled. However, energy travels on a one-way highway through the ecosystems and can be re represented a little bit like this, where energy enters the ecosystem through the process of photosynthesis, a whole bunch of stuff happens, and then all the energy is finally released as heat via cellular respiration. So in this, in this particular video, I want to spend some time diving deep into the stuff that happens box. But before I get into that, it's important to take a look at that first step, the sequestering of energy by the ecosystem. But don't panic, I'm not gonna be expounding on the joys of photosystems or electron carriers or plant pigments, but rather I wanna take a look at the big picture, the final product, and that is the energy transformed into organic materials. So if we look at a tree in a forest that is part of the ecosystem, that tree is gonna be busy photosynthesizing and in doing so is gonna take in CO2, release oxygen and increase in biomass, which is also known as the dry weight of the organic material in plants. So now it's time for a couple of definitions. First is the gross primary productivity or GPP, which is simply the total amount of chemical energy produced by the autotrophs of an ecosystem in a given time frame. So if you look at the energy in a section of forest, the GPP represents all of the energy contained in the organic molecules produced directly by photosynthesis. However, we know that plants also respire all the time, so a lot of that energy is turned around and lost as heat. What that leaves the ecosystem with is called the net primary production, or NPP, which is defined simply as the chemical energy that is assimilated into the plant and available for consumption. So you can see from this model that GPP is simply the NPP plus the energy lost through respiration. So think of this as a little bit of the, all the money that you might make in your lifetime, minus the total you spend on life itself, leaving the rest to pass on to your waiting children. And yes, just like in real life, those values vary in, different, in uh, different ecosystems. Now that we know what GP and NPP are, how do you actually measure this? Well, first of all, we need to understand that both of these are reported in terms of the quantity of energy per unit area per unit time. So for example, it makes little sense to say that your backyard garden has a GPP of 5,000 kilojoules. How big is your garden? How long did it take the garden to do it? This needs to be reported as something like 5,000 kilojoules per 100 square meters per month. Now, if we return to the diagram outlining the basics of photosynthesis, we can get an idea of what you can look at as evidence of productivity. You can determine it indirectly by measuring either the intake of CO2 or the release of oxygen, or you can measure it directly by the increase in biomass over time. That is all fine and dandy, but practically speaking, this is a very difficult thing to do in ecosystems. You certainly can't cut down a large section of forest and dry it to determine the biomass. And how would you go about measuring the intake of carbon dioxide or the release of oxygen in a large area of terrestrial or aquatic ecosystems? At best, you can estimate these things, but it is comp complicated business. In the controlled confines of a lab, however, it is possible. For example, to measure biomass increase, you could take two similar plants and obtain the dry mass of one of them to establish the starting biomass. You then let the other one grow for a specific amount of time, then obtain the dry mass of that one. And in this case, the difference between these two, or the increase in biomass, would directly represent the NPP of the plant. You can measure the GPP of a water plant such as Elodea by enclosing samples in two clear screw capped containers completely filled with water. You need some measure of photosynthesis and respiration so you can use probes or kits to take a baseline reading of the dissolved oxygen or CO2 depending on what you're measuring. Or you can take the pH of the water since that's also a measure of the dissolved carbon dioxide. So let's say for example here we check the dissolved oxygen of the water and it is 8 milligrams per liter. One of the containers is then covered tightly in foil 
to keep it in the dark. And at this point, it's prudent to remind ourselves that the pondweed or the yellow deer will respire whether it is in the dark or the light. Now we shine a light on the containers for a period of time to allow for photosynthesis in the uncovered tube. After the incubation period, it's time to test the DO levels again, and you would expect a decrease in the tube in the dark as plants take in oxygen for respiration, and an increase in the tube in the light due to a greater rate of oxygen release from photosynthesis compared to the oxygen consumption from the respiration. So what does this mean in terms of GPP and NPP? Well, the increase in dissolved oxygen in the uncovered bottle represents the oxygen produced by photosynthesis minus the oxygen used by respiration, which, when you think about it, is a measure of the NPP. And in this case, that's four milligrams per liter. Meanwhile, the decrease of DO in the covered bottle represents the oxygen consumed by the plant during respiration. And from our previous knowledge that GPP is simply NPP plus respiration, we can determine that this Elodea plant has a GPP of approximately 6 milligrams per liter of oxygen per 12 hour period. Okay, that was a lot of information about how ecosystems harness energy from the sun and assimilate it into organic molecules. But now we enter that realm of stuff happens, where we examine how the energy moves through the ecosystem. The easiest place to start is the basic food chain, which describes the movement of energy through a linear series of organisms by means of consumption. So a typical food chain that you might find in the Florida Everglades starts with a water plant called bladderwort, which, like all plants, will manufacture its own food through photosynthesis and therefore is called an autotroph. Bladderwort is a nice little snack for the grass carp, which in turn can be munched on by your friendly neighborhood alligator. And rounding out this particular food chain could be humans, and yes, I have tasted alligator in my life. So because these last three need to obtain their energy from other organisms, they are collectively called heterotrophs. Other names that are used to describe members of a food chain are uh, producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers, and so on. And yet one more way to categorize these is by trophic level, which basically describes the position of an organism in a particular food chain. Now this nomenclature can cause a bit of confusion at times since the secondary consumer actually occupies the third trophic level. And for that reason, you simply have to be careful about defining your terms and answering your questions correctly and carefully. But we all know life is not so simple and our culinary habits are not so uniform, so it's much more realistic when possible to describe the energy movements in an ecosystem in terms of a food web. So here's a basic food web in the Everglades which immediately shows more complex interactions than the previous simplistic food chain. The other benefit of accurate food web models is that it can help you predict what will happen ecologically if there is a disruption to the ecosystem due either to natural phenomenon or human interference or other things. So for example, if overfishing or some new disease were to significantly decrease the population of grass carp, you could use this food web model to predict some of the effects that it may have on the ecosystem. So since blue herons feed on carp, you might expect their numbers to decrease in response to their decreasing food supply. In contrast, fewer carp may result in higher amounts of bladderwort, which may translate into higher numbers of turtles. Now, the alligators? Who knows? They are losing carp and maybe some herons, but gaining turtles. So it's really hard to judge. And of course, there are abiotic factors to consider, as well as the fact that even this is a simplified food web. Food webs also demonstrate the difficulty of trying to place an organism into a particular trophic level. Take the alligator for example. Depending on which food chain you follow in this particular web, the alligator could be placed in the third, or the fourth, or even the fifth trophic level. So you have to be a little bit careful when, you, when you're trying to um, assign a particular trophic level to a particular organism. And of course, the more organisms you add to the food chain, the more complicated it becomes. So now that we have established the basic feeding relationships within an ecosystem, are we able to quantify the movement of energy through it? 
Well, the answer is yes, we can estimate it, but when looking at ecosystems, we generally look at trophic levels rather than individual species. And because a specific organism can fit into different trophic levels as shown in this particular diagram, the estimates are just that, estimates. However, there are general trends that appear when energy flow is measured in different ecosystems. So let's have a look at what happens in the Everglades when we group all the organisms into specific trophic level categories. One must start with the producers and get an estimate of the NPP since that is the amount of energy that has entered the ecosystem and is available for the next trophic level. So this box represents the NPP of all the producers and let's set that value arbitrarily at say 10,000 kilojoules per kilometer square per day. Now from there it has been shown that only about 10% of that energy is actually consumed or taken in by the primary consumers and yes those boxes are drawn to scale. That trend continues as the total of energy that enters the next trophic level is only 10% of the previous one and not surprisingly this is called the 10% rule, and it contributes to the overall shape of the diagram, which is aptly called an energy pyramid. Obviously, there are many ecosystem and trophic level situations where this rule is not followed exactly, but it does give us some guidelines when estimating energy flow values. And it also shows why there are so few apex predators in an ecosystem. It simply takes too much energy to sustain them all. But if the 10% rule is a reasonably accurate guideline that describes energy movement through an ecosystem, it does beg the question, where did the rest of the 90% of the energy from each trophic level go? Well, we know that every organism respires and that the conversion of organic molecules to ATP is quite inefficient, resulting in a significant loss of energy in the form of heat. But let's think about the other places where organic material does not make it to the next trophic level. So, when is the last time you had chicken feathers for dinner? Yeah, those are chicken feathers. Uh, or bones, or the beak, and yes, that's a beak. The point is that every organism has inedible parts that do not become part of the next trophic level. There is also material that you eat that never gets assimilated into your body. Yeah, that's the stuff that remains undigested and passes right through you. And finally, some organisms in the trophic level just simply die before they are consumed by the next trophic level. But there is still valuable energy to be had in all of this stuff and nutrients that need to be re re uh, recycled into the environment. So all this wonderful stuff becomes the responsibility of decomposers, a large group of diverse organisms that obtain energy by feeding on organic waste and ensuring that nutrients are released back into the soil for reuse. And of course, decomposers being living organisms respire and release heat as well. And that brings us full circle so we can make the connections between energy flow and energy pyramids by creating a model that incorporates both of these concepts. Now I started at the beginning of this video with this diagram which shows the sun being the ultimate source of all incoming energy into the ecosystem and that energy eventually all leaving as heat. But now we can summarize what happens to that energy while it is in the ecosystem. Photosynthetic organisms harness that energy as organic molecules, some of which are consumed and assimilated by primary consumers and then secondary consumers and then tertiary consumers, forming that classic energy pyramid shape. Now in this case, it's upside down and for purpose of clarity, it doesn't exactly follow the scale of the 10% rule. We can now model what happens to the energy that does not make it to the next trophic level. As I mentioned, a certain amount of energy is trapped in dead organisms, inedible or discarded parts, and the feces and other waste of the organisms. All of this energy is ultimately consumed and assimilated by decomposers. But these die and create waste as well, which are in turn consumed by other decomposers, and around and around we go. But since all organisms continually undergo respiration, ultimately all this energy is lost as heat to the atmosphere. So there you have it, a model that connects the concept of energy pyramids and the complete flow of energy through an ecosystem. Thanks for watching.